Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for uh, a really stimulating meeting, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to tell you about some work that uh, a student, Mary Cutteroff, has been doing in my laboratory uh, at the University of Virginia. Um, well, also some help from uh, former postdoc Thibault Vaux, who uh, was there for a while and helped her put together the MOT, which we are now using, or she is now using, to do those experiments. Um, as some of you may know, my, most of my work in the past with Rydberg atoms has involved wave packets single, uh, in single atoms, not, not talking about, or not, no communication between atoms, no cold atoms, atoms in beams. And so we're getting into the regime now where we'd like to start thinking about interactions between atoms. And so a problem that we've been thinking about for a long time and would like to consider uh, is the idea that if you have a wave packet in one atom, say like this, something very simple, and you have other atoms around, can you through some controlled interaction then again take that wave packet and split it up so that part of it remains on the atom that it was started on, but there's another wave packet on a different atom. Now it's not precisely the same wave packet, but perhaps there's some similarities. There is um, the same coherence, the same oscillation frequency, some properties that we can transfer from this original atom over to this one here and know something about those properties through the interaction that we can control. All right, so we want to do that through, um, through uh, Rydberg-Rydberg interactions. And in particular, we're going to try to do it through controlled interactions between pairs of atoms. So it's, we're not going into the regime where, or we're not interested right now in going to the regime where everything is correlated with everything else, but just two atoms at a time. And so there, there's some key capabilities that we need to develop. The first one is to be able to control and view Rydberg wave packets and isolated atoms. And, and you heard a beautiful talk by Barry just now about, about a lot of the great work that's being done there. Uh, we've done some work in that as well uh, with, with lower end states and shorter pulses. So we think we, we uh, can do quite a lot with that and bring a lot to the table there. Uh, the next part for, for us is, is wide open at this point, something we know essentially nothing about, and, but we're trying to learn. And so some of the problems that we are interested in exploring are uh, decoherence, dephasing, and non-nearest nearest neighbor interactions uh, when you have an ensemble of atoms uh, that are cold. Okay, so we're, we're also interested in getting to the point where motion is not very important, or if, uh, in fact, there is motion, how you can correct for the motion of the atoms. Uh, and, and through that, we're also interested in, in sort of manipulating or being able to manipulate, possibly, uh, the nearest neighbor distribution. And uh, we're, we're thinking about that, at least in collaboration with Francis. Uh, actually, Francis has done all the thinking on it, and so we hope to do some experiments, at least in the future, maybe far, far away. <laughs> okay, so, so that's where we want to go. And so the interaction that we want to start with is, is a resonant dipole-dipole interaction. You've heard a lot about that, uh, a lot about this, and, and most of you know a lot more about it than I do. Basic idea here is imagine that we have two atoms, atom A and atom B, and uh, atom A is in state one and atom B is in state uh, one prime, and there is a dipole-dipole coupling between these two atoms. Uh, through an interaction which looks something like this uh, in terms of their dipole moments and the interaction, uh, excuse me, the, the distance between the two. And if we have the condition where the energy separation between state one and state two matches that between one prime and two prime, we have a resonant interaction and this process proceeds that we can in fact make this transition from one to two and one prime to two prime, as you, as you all know. And of course this is explored and has been explored uh, by Tom and Pierre and many others for, for a long time. Um, so the, the nice thing about resonant dipole-dipole interactions in a Rydberg atom, of course, as Tom has explained many times, is that, is that you have the tunability of the, of the energies with field, okay? so that you can turn the interaction on and off quite simply by, by uh, small changes in an electric field, which can be done rather rapidly on the time scales of interest. Okay, but, but from my perspective, there's something else that's really important about this particular picture, this, this Landau-Zehner picture. Uh, and, and that is, of course, that the eigenstates are also changing their composition dramatically. And so not only can you turn on and off the interactions, you have exquisite control over the wave functions of, in the system. Okay? You, can, you can essentially do any manipulation you want on the quantum state simply by pulsing fields back and forth across uh, this resonance or sitting at various places on this for various times. Okay? So pulse sequences allow you complete control over the wave function as long as you uh, maintain coherence. And you can see that through some parameter, which we in the laboratory is, is f. Mathematically, we can write it as phi, which is, of course just the, the, the determines the composition of the of the uh, say the final the non-interacting states here in terms of or the 
the composition of the non-interacting states that are in these interacting states here, plus and minus, excuse me. Okay. All right, so that's, that's all stuff you know. We're, I'm going to spend a whole lot of this talk talking about stuff that you've probably seen before if you've ever seen Tom Gallagher give a talk. Um, and, and so we're, we're starting off again, as I said, with MOTS. So uh, we figured it's best to start in places where we know what the answer is supposed to be. So we decided to do, redo a lot of experiments. And so um, we're going to be working on similar problems that Tom was looking at, say, over 10 years ago, and Pierre was looking at similar systems. So we're going to go into a MOT and look at these uh, resonant dipole-dipole interactions. We're going to study the rubidium case, which Tom studied. And basically, the idea is if you start off with uh, atoms that are in a MOT, they're cold, but not real cold, about 300 microkelvin. And you use pulse dye lasers to excite from the upper trap state up to two states, S and S prime, which are 33S and 25S in this particular case. Uh, they can undergo, at some electric field, a dipole-dipole interaction, which allows coupling from uh, this S state to two different P3 half states here, or one particular P1 half state down here. Okay. And so in the experiment, what we do is we excite with these pulse dye lasers. We can either do that in the presence of an electric field or pulse on an electric field afterwards. Through the interaction, uh, we get some states P and P prime, and we can measure the population in those states, P and P prime. Particularly, we measure P prime up here because it's, it's more highly excited. It's the first one to come out in the state selective field ionization scan. So that's typically what we look, like, look at. Our dye lasers have have durations of about five nanoseconds, which are very, very short compared to any other time scale in the problem. So we can assume they're instantaneous. And then we also have another uh, time scale which we can vary, which is the duration that we let the, the atoms interact after they've been excited. Okay. So here's what uh, we see. Uh, again, uh, I think plot's very similar to what you've seen in the past. I, I do want to note that uh, in this particular case, because there are these two resonants here, we have the problem that uh, although I might be showing or might have been talking about single Landau-Zehner crossings, we actually have two of them, but they're essentially non-interacting because they're, uh, they're communicating with different final states. So at low density here, we see by exciting with our dye lasers, uh, and, and we're exciting at a particular field here, say, and we let our atoms interact for a given time after that, that excitation, and then we pulse field ionize. So what we do is we take a coherent superposition of these states. The bandwidth of our laser is enormous compared to the separation between these states. So we make a coherent superposition. So it evolves. And in doing the projection, okay, we end up getting some population in, in this upper state when we originally only had population in this state here. And we can look at the, the transfer of the, the final states that we have as a function of the, of the field. And what we see is there are, are resonances and there are widths to those resonances. And those resonance widths are, of course, related to the interaction strength here at the center of the crossing. And so we find that that interaction strength increases with density, as you might expect, because the separation between atoms is, of course, uh, decreasing with density. And we find that these widths do, in fact, scale uh, linearly with density. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so how does this compare? Uh, Tom mentioned yesterday uh, that Francis uh, was looking at this problem also recently and looking into an issue with how do you, how do you reconcile these widths with what you would expect from, from a calculation. And if you go into a density at, say, 10 to the 9th per cubic centimeter and you calculate uh, by just assuming that the uh, nearest neighbor distance is uh, 1 over uh, this number cubed, uh, excuse me, one, one over this number to the cube root, uh, what you find is that you get this green curve here for what the resonance width should be. Okay? And if, in fact, you go into the, uh, find, look up the correct distribution for nearest neighbors, and you put in what, a, what the actual uh, typical separation between atoms is, you end up getting this red curve, okay? which is a factor of 2 pi greater than, than that crude estimate. Now, if, in fact, you put all possible distances in there and, and do the integration over the full distribution, what you get is this solid curve here, which is this cusp shape that Tom was talking about yesterday, which has these large wings on the outside and a sharp spike in the center. And again, you have large wings because you have some atoms that are very, very close together. And so they interact very rapidly. They interact very strongly. And so you, in fact, get this very broad resonance due to those, uh, those nearby atoms. And then you can pile up narrow resonances due to the atoms that are very, very far away, which ends up giving you that spike. Okay, so if we, we can also think about this problem in time. So what I'd like to do now is imagine that we do an excitation and, and sit at a single 
uh, value of electric field as we did in the last problem, but now scan the time delay when we project out of the system. So what we're looking at is the population develop in this P state as a function of time. Okay? And so if we sit very near to the center of the resonance, sort of near the peak of that cusp, what we get is something like these red points here, which you see some features. This thing is really not saturated, even at long times at four microseconds. It's continuing to rise, okay? which is what you might expect if there were some really, really weak couplings there from very far away atoms, which is what you expect to be getting if you're on resonance. You're getting things that happen fast, so we see a, some, some things rise sharply, but then other things happening very slowly out here. However, if we excite out here on the, on the tail of the resonance, what we see is we see a pretty fast rise, and then this thing saturates much more rapidly. Okay? There's less signal to begin with, okay? but there's also more of a saturation because we're typically dealing with only those atoms that are, that are closer together, and so they don't take so long to interact. Okay? All right. So um, let, me, let me take a step back. So, so it seems to make sense. Uh, at least what we're looking at. So what we'd like to find out is, uh, is there anything that's coherent in this process? So again, we go to an experiment that Tom and his collaborators did uh, several years ago. And this was, uh, if you want to know something about coherence, you do an interference experiment. So that's precisely what they did. They started off by exciting their atoms very far off resonance. And then they used a short electric field pulse to pulse onto the resonance for uh, a given amount of time and then pulsed off and sat over here for a delay tau or delay capital T, and then did that again. So essentially you have two interaction times with a controlled time delay between them, and so you can get uh, Ramsey interference or, or two-path interference between those two interaction times. Okay, so this is actually, again, data from our lab, just like those resonance widths were, although I'm, I'm talking about Tom's experiments, we actually have data of our own, so that's, that's what we're showing, not his. But the idea here is, of course, is that as you change the delay between these two pulses that are sort of building up the sides of your interferometer or your two interaction times, you see that you do, in fact, get interference oscillations, at least for some amount of time. Okay, so we have, we can get something like a dephasing time or a coherence time if you want. Uh, if you're not, you have to be a little careful about what's dephasing and what's coherence, and we'll get back to that in a minute. But if we look at, say, 1 over 2 pi, uh, tau or tau some, something like the 1 over E point, if you can define it for this, this curve, you get something like 1.5 megahertz. Okay. So it's a little bit different. This is in the case of about rho is equal to 10 to the 9, where we had widths of about 6 megahertz otherwise. Okay. But what we do find, and what, what Tom found uh, back uh, years ago, was that the slope increases. So that this, this dephasing time, in fact, increases with density and increases sort of parallel to what these widths gamma did. So the, the widths of those resonances included an inhomogeneous term that's due primarily to the magnetic field in the MOT. There's magnetic field gradient, which uh, if the magnetic field is not turned off, gives you, uh, uh, for, the, for the inhomogeneity that we have in a one millimeter MOT, is on the order of about four megahertz. So it matches pretty well with what this is. And although I haven't worked it out precisely, I believe that because of the way this experiment is done, you don't, uh, you don't lose phase when you pulse out the electric field in precisely that way due to the magnetic field because it's in a different dimension. So it, that's a little complicated. I'm not positive about that. But the idea is that you don't see the dephasing due to the inhomogeneities in the magnetic field because of the way we've done this experiment. So you would essentially subtract off that inhomogeneous broadening from the magnetic field, and then this dephasing measurement agrees with what you, we would see, uh, in fact, for the, for the resonance width. Okay? But it really is dephasing. Okay? I, I've said that you can subtract off this inhomogeneous part, but there may be other inhomogeneities, and in fact there are. There's, say, a 1% inhomogeneity in the electric field that we're using, and that's going to con contribute to this, to this width at some point, too. Okay? So let's just summarize, and this isn't the summary of the talk, yet. How much? I still got a while to go. Um, so um, just summarizing what we know about these resonances is that you, you see a dephasing rate and a resonance width increase with, with density. And they increase linearly with density, which is what you'd expect if there were isotropic nearest neighbor interactions. Okay? So it doesn't prove anything, but it is what you would expect. You get a minimum uh, line width, l resonance line width of about 4 megahertz, which is consistent with primarily a magnetic field, but also an electric field in homogeneity in the MOT. And this last point is the problem, at least now. Uh, the dephasing rate that you get, if we assume that this rate 
is in fact the one that we should compare to these calculations, say right here, as what this width is. This width is a half a megahertz, and this one is one and a half megahertz. So we're still a factor of three off, okay, if you believe the, if you believe the density calibration. And, and at this point, uh, our MOT isn't calibrated well, so we're calibrating our density based off of the resonances widths that we, we compare with, with previous measurements. All right, so uh, we'd like to go a little bit further and try to figure out where this additional factor of three comes from. Well, of course, it was presented quite a while back, a possible mechanism for what could be going on and what could be causing this additional broadening, and it had to do with uh, always resonant interactions and hopping within, uh, within the MOT, and these are beyond nearest neighbor interactions. So imagine that we have within the MOT a couple of pairs of, of atoms that are, say, close to each other. Okay, and they're closer than average to each other. So the population transfer can be initiated through these anomalously close pairs. Okay, so we can get a fast rate of transition. So this is uh, this, this standard interaction that we're interested in, and the, and the closer ones interact faster. So we transform S atoms into P atoms in those localized places. And then in a, in a very crude way, we could say, all right, but now these atoms are excited, and they're sitting next to other atoms. And it turns out there are other interactions which appear to be resonant, right? We can do a swap so that an atom in S, excuse me, an atom in S and an atom in P can just swap locations, and there's no energy cost to that, at least in this model, because these atoms have already collided. And so you can actually then couple these two and couple these two and these two and these two through these types of interactions. Okay, so that happens, and then this P atom jumps over, and so these atoms hop out of the way, and now we're left with S, S atoms close again, and, of course, then the process starts over again, and now we have more atoms. So, you, in fact, you can get a large signal, a large population transfer from a very few number of atoms if, in fact, this hopping works. Okay. So, Francis hates this. <laughs> he published a paper to say so. <laughs> um, so, this is my, this is my interpretation of, of, of the, the problem, and, and I'm gonna, it's going to take a little while to explain this figure. Um, but hopping is improbable at low densities, okay? And we're working it still at pretty low densities. So what this plot is, if I can explain it without completely confusing you, is a plot of uh, the probability that the nearest neighbors in an ensemble have an interaction energy compared, uh, that compares to the mean interaction energy as shown on this scale, okay? So in, in order for, at, at this particular point here, there's 50% chance okay, that we have the mean interaction for the nearest neighbors, which is what you would expect, because okay? this is the nearest neighbor interaction that we're, we're discussing. However, if you go to the next nearest neighbor and you say, what's the chance that one of those other atoms has someone sitting next to it with uh, the same interaction energy, then you drop down to this point on the curve. Okay? So it's much smaller. You'd have to actually go to... Um, if you, if you look at the most probable distance between next nearest neighbors, the interaction associated with that is much smaller. So if we're talking about this hopping being, being facilitated by nearest atoms, they're maybe somewhere over here in this tail. And if you look at the size of the interaction for the next nearest neighbor, okay, at this point, it's very unlikely that these two are the same size, okay, that those interaction energies are the same size. Right. So, one thing that you can say is, is that once these two, for the two nearest by atoms that are interacting, they have some interaction strength that's maybe 10 times this average interaction strength. Okay? That means there's an energy shift associated with those, which means that those closest pairs uh, have different energies than they would if they weren't close together. So in fact, hopping over to the nearest neighbor changes the energy of the system. Okay? And so it doesn't happen. It's not a resonant interaction after all. And again, I'm stealing Francis's words in a very poor way uh, when I say this. Um, but the idea is, is that you don't really have these resonant interactions because this picture of one interaction happening and then the other one happening just isn't valid. They're all there all the time. Okay. Another way of looking at this in the time domain, which is the way that I like to look at things, is um, you have sort of a rapid Rabi flopping. If you think of this resonance as uh, the, the, the transitions in terms of Rabi flopping, is that when you have the strong interaction here, you have a very rapid Rabi flopping of the state vector okay, in, in one pair of atoms. 
And if you look at then, say, the, the next interaction and you say, all right, if I look at the most, uh, the, the most probable next interaction, it's way down here, maybe a factor of 10 or maybe a factor of 100 smaller, which means that that precession of phase is about 100 times smaller. And so what, ha what can happen, of course, is that you get a cancellation of that phase advance. You have a slow advance on one clock due to the so-called always resonant interactions. And then you have a very rapid phase advance due to the other clock. And so on average, this very rapid phase completely cancels out the slow phase of the other one. Okay? And this is perfectly analogous to, s to spin locking in NMR. Okay? This happens, and people have known about this for a long time. And it's something we use very recently to suppress decoherence in wave packets. Okay, in a very similar system where we had uh, fine structure wave packets which uh, we could control through, a, through an avoided level crossing, very similar to this problem, we showed that you could just turn on an RF field and drive it and completely suppress the decoherence in a way something like what Barry was talking about uh, in his talk. Okay? All right. So maybe this happens or maybe it doesn't happen or maybe it's important at some level. And so the question is at what level are these things important? We'd like to do some other measurement. So, one way to look at coherence and not just dephasing is, of course, to do an echo experiment. So uh, people have looked at echoes. Uh, people in this audience have looked at echoes, uh, at rotary echoes, to study, um, to study Van der Waals interaction. So we're going to use a different type of echo, or we'd like to use a different type of echo, a spin-type echo, to study this problem. Unfortunately, there's some technical complications that I don't really want to go into, but it turned out that we didn't really do a standard echo experiment. Well, what I'll say we did is something that's it's echo inspired. Okay? And so the idea is similar. The idea was uh, to flip the state back and forth to reverse time in, in a way that you would do in a spin echo experiment. But we don't do it in the standard way. So in order to do that kind of echo experiment, and we've done these, by the way, in other landau zehner systems, is that if you started way off, if you got some population in, in, in these two states and you start way off of resonance, and you transfer through the resonance, one of, these state vec one of these states flips sign compared to the other. And so you can reverse time simply by jumping to one side of the resonance and back. And so we couldn't actually do this very far away, so we decided, well, what if we didn't jump all the way off the resonance? What if we sat on the resonance on one side and then hopped over to the other side for an equal amount of time and then looked at the interference that would occur between the interactions here and the interactions here? Okay. So we're not putting population in before we start doing the echo. The population transfer and the echo are happening together. Okay. It turns out it's much more similar to quasi-phase matching. Uh, either you could think of this in the time domain or, or in the frequency domain uh, than it is to, to an echo. Okay. So the, the basic pulse sequence looks something like this. We sit on one side of the resonance for some amount of time, big T, and then we pulse over to the other side of the resonance for some time, big T, and then we pulse out of the system and we look at the total population transfer. Okay. It turns out this interference is constructive okay, for, for any value of phi that we, that we pick to, to do this separation for, as long as the system remains coherent. Okay. It turns out, of course, that the amount of constructive interference depends on how far off the peak of the resonances are you when you do this hopping. Interestingly, uh, what we have for a figure of merit is not the total population that we transfer to the p-states, but the population we transfer to the p-state in doing this hop from what we would have had if we sat here for twice the amount of time. Okay, so if we sit here for time 2t, or if we sit here for t and go here, here to t and compare those results and take the ratio, that's an interesting figure of merit. Okay. And so here, in fact, is some data that was taken. And there you have two different sets of curves. So we have red dots, and, or red circles and black circles, which correspond to uh, doing the hop and sitting on the right-hand side and then going to the left-hand side and hopping out, or going to the, from starting on the left-hand side, hopping to the right-hand side and going out, or sitting here for twice as long and sitting here for twice as long and hopping out. And these are the signals that you see. And clearly, we see an enhancement as we would expect, or as I suggested that we would expect, due to coherence. Okay? So what we'd like to look at is, as a function of time, can you monitor something about the coherence of the system by looking at the decay of this enhancement over time? Just basically what you would do in an echo experiment. Okay? Except for our echo signal, if you want to call it an echo, is the enhancement of this signal here. Okay? So here's three different plots, and now I'm looking at the ratio of my echo signal compared with the non-echo signal. 
and that's done at three different densities, and I don't quote them as densities, I'm just quoting them as the resonance width at the density which we operated at. And here is just, I have black data points, which are again the ratios, and these are all done somewhere near the 50% point of the resonance width. Okay? And the red line here is just a fit to these data, just a linear fit. And the green curve is what we would have calculated the enhancement to be if there were only nearest neighbor interactions uh, in, at, in our mod. Okay? And, and so it looks like, I'm not going to say that these red lines sloping down means that we're losing coherence. There's too much scatter in the data, I think. Maybe in this one you can believe, but there seems to be a trend that this slope is increasing a little bit, and this line is starting to deviate more from this line, but we just don't have enough data yet. Okay, this data was taken at the end of last week, and so hopefully there'll be more soon. Okay. But the thing that you should look at is that the enhancement here, we're looking at factors of two, not 10%, not, not, not 5%, but factors of two uh, enhancement in the signal that persists for times up to four microseconds, and that's when she stopped and started taking more data on a, on a, on a different state. We're seeing very little decoherence. Okay. And so it seems like the coherence persists, if we just take that 100 or 120 nanosecond dephasing time we got from the Ramsey experiment and compared to this, this is already 40 times, and we haven't come close to this thing dephasing yet. Okay. All right, so you can say, well, okay, what, is this going to really tell you anything then? And sort of what we're hoping it will tell us is something about decoherence eventually. And so these are just some calculations I, I whipped out. They're very simple. And, and, and they're only approximate, but the idea is suppose that you had atoms moving and you want to take the moving atoms into account. And so if we had a density of about 10 to the 10th atoms per cubic centimeter and we have a temperature of 300 microkelvin, which is what we estimate the, the temperature of the mod is, and you can, you can then look at what happens because these atoms move relative to each other. It means the distance between them is changing as a function of time, which means the interaction is changing as a function of time. This is the decoherence we're looking for, as opposed to simple dephasing. So this is what you would see in terms of the actual pseudo echo signal compared to the signal where we sit in one place. And there's some oscillations that always appear in the calculations that never seem to appear in the experiment. I don't know if it's signal to noise or just we haven't taken into account the, uh, the, the gradient of the intensities of the lasers or of, of the MOT density, just the, the, uh, the nearest neighbor separations in the MOT. And so that may be what averages over all these oscillations at early time. But what we see, and this is on uh, sort of near on the edges of the resonance, so we don't have very much signal when, we sit on, uh, when we're just sitting there and waiting some amount of time. But what you see is the ratio of these two curves. I don't have to actually divide them for you. You can see that they're approaching one. And in this curve where we're, I've increased the temperature by an order of magnitude, you see that they, in fact, come back together again, which is what you would expect. Perfect. So we would expect, then, that if there was decoherence, that, the me that this measurement, this, this echo-like technique, would in fact allow us to see the decay of that coherence over time. Okay? And just to show you that it works in, in a somewhat quantitative way, you would expect that if we compared sort of the average separation, uh, the time that you would get uh, by dividing the average separation by the velocity, it's about 17 microseconds, and you can see these things are approaching and believe that this might happen uh, somewhere over here somewhere where they came together. And if you do it in this case at 3 millikelvin, then this is five microseconds, which looks pretty good to where we would expect these to come together. So it does look like we can get something quantitative, but I haven't given you any, uh, any specifics of how it might be quantitative, and simply because I don't know. Uh, we haven't been doing it for long enough and haven't analyzed enough to know the quantitative relationship between uh, this measurement technique and the actual coherence of the state, as opposed to just being able to tell there is something changing with the state. <clears throat> OK, so, so with that, I'd just like to say that um, I think that the coherence of the dipole-dipole interactions in the frozen Rydberg gas appears to be longer lived than previously thought. It can actually be quite long, uh, at least at the densities that we're dealing with, which I think are comparable to the ones that were done before. Uh, it depends to be, appears to be many microseconds at least. And it's, it's not clear, I think, and, and hopefully Francis will have a big smile on his face, it's not clear that interactions beyond nearest neighbors need to be involved. Okay. They, they may be involved at some level, but it's not clear at this point that they have to be uh, because the, uh, the rates aren't that far off. Now, <clears throat> on the to-do list, quickly, is to, is to get a, a, a more accurate MOT calibration of our MOT 
to see if we can resolve the, something about this factor of three uh, uh, dependent or difference between the measured widths and 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 what we would expect uh, from from the uh, the nearest neighbor uh, interactions within the MOT, and maybe it's just a calibration error in the MOT density. Uh, we could explore. Uh, and really want to explore. This is something I can do because I'm not the one doing the experiments, unfortunately, anymore. Uh, try to explore the quantitative relationship between what this partial or quasi or pseudo echo signal is and state coherence. Again, it's much more relevant to, to quasi phase matching. And so I might think of it in, in, in those terms instead. Uh, we want to explore this coherence at higher mod densities and perhaps at longer times to see if we can really measure or watch the decay of coherence so we can monitor it. And then lastly, and this was the main part of starting out, these other experiments were really just a way to get to the thing that we really wanted to do, which is that we thought all these other processes were going on within the MOT, and we wanted to get rid of them. So we were coming up with ways the first place to try to suppress these beyond nearest neighbor interactions and the atom motion effects. And this can be done, I believe, with dynamic decoupling schemes like bang-bang or continuous decoupling that we've used before in Rydberg atom experiments uh, using the same types of pulse sequences that we're using now to make these measurements. Okay? So in principle, if you're flipping the state backwards and forwards very fast, either through a continuous drive or by pi pulses, which can be done in the landau zehner just by simply moving through the crossing, then you can effectively get rid of this decoherence, this transfer of coherence to degrees of freedom you're not measuring, simply by flipping the state vector fast enough. Okay? All right, so, so that's it for the talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions, remarks? <coughs> Just a, a short comment concerning this question whether there's only pairs or other high orders involved. We also did some measurements on this dynamics of the uh, state transfer and uh, compared it to a full quantum uh, calculation of uh, two, three, four, six particles involved. And we saw no difference between having either, involving all, the, uh, all these states that uh, you just mentioned, and we also saw that in the signals that we finally measured, there was first no sign of decoherence except decay, and second of all, it was enough to involve two particles already to see the, to get good agreement. Right. And, and over what uh, range, at some point this is gonna break percent. down, right? Because um, if, I, if I just go back to, to this plot again, at some point, that should break down because once you get to the points in here where um, you were either at long time or you were at, in, at at very high densities, then all these interactions should be important. But at lower at we lower densities, the same ballpark as your experiments. So okay. the same ballpark. So that mean I wouldn't expect anything beyond two particles in that case. Mm -hmm. <coughs> You got so many. You got a very high fraction of your atoms in Rydberg states in these experiments. Um, are you? Do you have some reason to believe that they aren't going to uh, do any super radiant kind of uh, dynamics? Um, I haven't. I, I don't think the. No. Okay. So I, I. I'll just say I'll just claim ignorance on that because I. I haven't. Although I've heard about it, I haven't worked out any details for our particular Mont conditions, and so. Um, I can't tell you. And again, I think our densities are pretty low, so I, I'm not sure that's going to be a problem for us, but I won't say that it's not a problem. We don't see things going to other states, so not, at least not other Rydberg states. We don't, we're not in a regime where we see stuff going to plasmas. And so a lot of the things that people are seeing that may seem important may just be that our densities are just too low for that to be important here. Okay. Yeah. Do you have any problem with the force, the dipole force between the atom and the proton? Okay, so, so the dipole force is interesting, and it, it at of course at the at the temperatures we're uh, we're interested in, uh, it turns out that if you if you compute sort of the acceleration over over the time scales that at least for the dephasing time scales, it's it's much less than the thermal motion. So at 300 microkelvin, the thermal motion is dominating everything. Now at these much much longer time scales. Uh, it may turn out to be important because there's an acceleration as opposed to a constant motion. So I actually haven't gone through and figured out if we have these very weak interactions at what point you expect there to be a crossover between the acceleration between the atoms and, and uh, the thermal motion. 
And, and I apologize that a lot of this stuff is just really new. So most of the thinking on it, most of the data is less than a week old. So. Okay, so let us thank the speaker again.